What's going on, everybody? I'm your host, Spencer Gray, and welcome to The Gray Report. The Gray Report, you know, we're talking everything that's going on in the multifamily industry, real estate, and the economy, kind of in that order. Um, so whether if you're an active investor, kind of looking into the whole world of real estate investing, or, you know, you're already an industry insider, kind of in the trenches already, well, this is a show just for you. We're bringing the latest, you know, research reports, articles, opinions on um, myself and Matt Boss and I, we're breaking it down every week. Um, so, you know, it's Thanksgiving week right now. Uh, we're kind of getting our way through the end of November, um, but still a lot of new information for the multifamily industry and the economy. So let's just get into it. All right. Welcome again, everybody, to The Gray Report. We've got Director of Communications and Marketing, Great Capital, Matt Bosnoggle, joining us once again. Um, Matt, how's it going this week? It's pretty good. Um, you know, we're moving into the new offices, and and uh, I'm getting excited for Thanksgiving. Um, a little bit uh, a little bit more of an, of an interesting week, I think, for, for multifamily and the economy uh, than last week. Um, there might be a, a, return, a return to normalcy or a, a return to uncertainty. It's it's uh, it all depends on how you interpret the. Uh, yeah, the yeah, it's a, it's a little bit, little bit of both, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's some normalcy out there, some seasonality. We're gonna get into that. You know, we saw some slower rent growth, still rent growth, but kind of just some slowing down in October, which which you, you would expect to see. Um, but looking back on this past year has been incredible and in, in breaking all kinds of records. I'm gonna touch on that as well. Um, and then, you know, we had some other surveys um, about you know, uh, preference and renters, specifically Gen Z renters. So I think that's I think that's fascinating. Um, just for first, Matt, before we kind of just jump you know, right into this, I, I got to point out um, to everybody that's watching, watching or listening, you can um, stay up to date on everything that's going on in the multifamily industry in one place. And that's Gray Report, uh, grayreport.com. Um, it is the premier multifamily intelligence aggregator. Um, and you know we're, we're very proud of it. Matt's done a lot, a lot of work putting this together, but it's really the one spot um, online that if you are focused on multifamily and multifamily industry, commercial real estate, we're aggregating pretty much every important piece of information and content that comes out related to the multifamily industry. So whether that's you know the data that comes out, new research reports, articles, opinions, speculation, um, it's all in one spot, including videos, podcasts, market updates. Um, and then, you know, while you're there, make sure you are signed up for the great report newsletter. It comes out every Thursday at 830 and it is, it's known as the, it's, it's the best multifamily, um, newsletter out there on the market. So if you're not signed up, hop on over to greatreport.com. You can do all that fun stuff. So Matt, just first, um, when we're starting, I, I, and again, this isn't, uh, this is not multifamily specifically, but I think we, it's good to mention and important the fact that, you know, we are seeing, um, COVID starting to surge again, you know, right before Thanksgiving holiday, um, right before just the holiday season in general, I think a lot of people are hoping this is going to be the last wave, but I think we've said that every single, um, you know, wave that we've seen, hoping that the wave is going to be a little bit smaller than the last one, although that hasn't yeah. always been the case. Um, again, this is, you know, kind of macro, um, what, what, what do you think is going to happen? I know you're, you're dealing with a little bit of a COVID, um, you know, yeah, you know, there was a, uh, there, I'm, I'm taking care of a kid who may who may or may not have it because there was an exposure in his school. You know, uh, a bunch of families are, are experiencing the same thing. It seems like, you know, every school has every week there's some, you know, there's one classroom that's got to stay home. And that's just school age kids. Um, if you look nationally at that that chart, you can see how earlier in the in November there was a dip and and I was optimistic I was happy everyone was happy and now it's starting to creep up again um even even so like despite that little dip there if you look um if you kind and and this is not in that article itself but if you expand the covid chart and look at the infection rate the delta surge was the biggest or or was the biggest one this year but that delta surge was dwarfed by the by the initial um, the initial surge, which was like around almost like December and February, um, you know, previously. So if it's, if there's any pattern to this, then maybe we can expect a lower surge. 
Um, but but again, this is there's no rules for this. I thought that we were out of this thing a couple of weeks ago, and COVID decided that that wasn't true. And I'm sorry, I, I can't talk to the virus, but um, but I can only be optimistic that this that people can that people are learning how to deal with it. We've got there's new drugs on the market, new treatments, and you know um, vaccines are expanded to every to more people. The booster shots are now expanded to everyone. Um, so the the tools are there. It, it what i'm wondering and this is just purely speculation is is how much of this is going to be you get your year you you get your six month booster or maybe you need a maybe you just need to schedule that doctor's appointment every six months that's that's kind of crazy but that's something that i was thinking about it's certainly annoying i wish i didn't have to do it yeah i, I think you know everybody getting a flu shot once a year is you know a challenge enough for most people every yeah. six months that's a lot i'm curious you know if they're going to you know what they're going to do to possibly extend the you know effective you know time for some of these vaccines and there's we've now got a lot of uh studies that you know there's there's a difference you know between the different vaccines yeah you know, it seems like moderna has you know significantly more um effect efficacy and the length of that it'll actually kind of stick yeah. around and, and be effective um, i have heard that maybe if you get the booster you're good for another year basically so you're not it's we'll like see, those we'll first, see. yeah yeah you know yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see I, that, that that'd be great yeah. um so i think it's something to pay attention to um you know but, there's a lot of dynamics yeah go ahead matt yeah so i just wanted to note i mean this is the this is the thing that worries me as much is this passage it says as unsatisfying as this is the full explanation for the surge remains unclear there is still much more that scientists do not know about how this virus spreads than they do know and you know what that's what's that's what's kind of scary or at least that's what this really deflates you know kind of like dampens the enthusiasm that i had earlier this week is is uh is we don't even know why there's no delta there's no uh variant that we can name it even it's almost better if you can know what's going on but this is just a surge that may be related to people going indoors it's the, it's the closest thing that i can think of yeah I mean, that make that makes sense i mean there's a lot of other stuff going around there too just yeah. people are getting sick i mean yeah i've had a lot of my a lot of our kids they've been they've been sick um so it's, it's partially that time of year just you know hopefully less covid um, okay. So I just want to jump into, you know, while we're kind of talking about sort of macro stuff, um, I, I, we could be, um, amiss to not mention that Biden has, um, reappointed or renominated, um, the current federal reserve chairman, Jerome Powell, um, for a second four year term, um, basically signaling that, you know, more of the same and, you know, more or less approving of his actions during the pandemic. Um, I also think, you know, uh, compared to, because, the alternative, um, Governor yeah. Leo you know, uh, Brainard or Brainard, I've heard it pronounced a couple in a couple of different ways. You know, would have been seen as more dovish. Now that they were appointed as the vice chair, but um, you know, if Brainard had actually been nominated, the idea was that even more dovish policy, lower rates were re much longer. And even though Powell's pretty dovish himself, um, really wanted to see inflation get a little bit hotter to maximize employment. This could be a signal, you know, one from Biden that they're not going to give in to progressives because, you know, Elizabeth Warren and quite a few other Democrats um, not as happy with Jerome Powell, want, a more, want even more dovish monetary policy. But the Biden administration is seeming to understand that inflation is a major political threat to his president, his renomination, um, his reelection, as well as the prospects of Democrats um, for the next election um, in, in future elections because people vote with their pocketbook. And if they're seeing prices go up, we've all seen the, you know, I did that Joe Biden um, stickers at like the gas pump or, or pictures of them. And yeah. that's one thing that people can, <laughs> even whether it's right or wrong and if he's a blame for it or not, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, people you got to find something to blame. Got to find somebody to blame, and and so I think that they are now looking at this as inflation as a major political threat, and saying we don't need more dovish policy if we're already going to be spending trillions of more dollars. Let's kind of keep the same thing going, and then we can always look back as if at some point, you know, the Federal Reserve will over they'll overshoot and they'll they'll have kept things lower for too long, and when they do, they can look they can say, well, we didn't even appoint this guy. Um, Trump appointed Jerome Powell. Exactly. He's, he, we, this is, this is even though Biden will have nominated him a second time, but Trump's hands are on it. So they'll try to 
cast off blame um, on Republicans, I, I, I would imagine. Well, see, and that's what I was wondering. There's there, there could be a little bit of a strategy here. If there was no discussion of Brainerd, then maybe people would have been looking at Jerome Powell and saying, oh, well, you know, he's you know, he doesn't seem to care that much about inflation. But now because of that alternative, he can pick Jerome Powell in really a bid for, I think, stability. Mm -hmm. Um, At least at the very least, that's what he's got is is stability. And he's got really a guy that a guy that may is not going to be like you said, not going to be an inflation hawk anyways. So uh, so I think the Republicans may be relieved that it's not Brainerd. And Biden may be happy that it's that it's someone that you know can keep interest rate rates low. Yeah, because 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 Brainerd came in and all of a sudden, regardless of happened with inflation, no matter what, people would say, you know, you put this, you know, very dovish, you know, whatever you know name would be thrown at him. Um, this is who this is your Fed this is your Fed chair. Yep. So this if this is you own this inflation. Um, so, and then just to kind of see where things are at, um, because it's not necessarily going to be in the fed funds rate, but really looking at the 10 year, 10 year treasury rate, you know, we've seen a big difference, um, really since November 8th, sorry, well, well, really since, yeah, November 8th, November 9th, we've seen the 10 year treasury really start to move up. You can even go back to really kind of September when, you know, things really started moving, I guess it was here at the end of September, about a month ago, September 22nd. I mean, you know, rates basically move from, you know, 1.12 all the way up to, you know, 1.663 where they are um, today. That, that That's a that, that's a relatively big move. It'll be interesting to see how um, the spreads that lenders are charging is affected. Um, and with financing rates and for multifamily assets have definitely ticked up um, over the past um, several months or so. And it'll be interesting to see how this continues to change. Still incredibly low historically. But compared to, you know, call it six, eight months ago, we are seeing slightly higher rates, the higher cost to borrow. Um, but it just that's being offset by higher growth. Um, so we will we'll see how it goes. And then just one last macro um, piece before we get into really multifamily and a lot of really good reports from Globe Street, um, apartment list, real page. Uh, Matt, I just want to touch on, touch on this uh, existing home sales. This is kind of tr- the transitioning yeah to um real estate um a good report about out from regions on existing home sales um sagging sales trend tells the real story um you know their their real their main headline is october existing home sales a lump of coal all wrapped up in ribbons <laughs> and bows yeah. so <laughs> it's a good title um so long story short um prices are still up um existing home sales are still moving um you know, prices are up 13% year over year. And, and over a year ago, prices were significantly up oh, since 2019 prices. But then inventories, um, you know, it's amazing. You know, you see it, all kinds of single family home development going on right now, but it doesn't seem like it's really making too much of a dent. If you see, look, just looking at this inventories and, and this, if this doesn't paint you the picture of why how, how home prices are going up, yeah. And why prices are where they are. And I, I think pokes, you know, a little bit of a hole in, in the bubble argument. Um, mm-hmm. It's just look at these inventories. We have not even started to kind of dig our dig our way out. Um, this has been a systemic long term problem. And we're just now um, seeing the result of it. I mean, this this is I remember I remember having, you know, th- you know, thoughts, you know, a couple of years ago looking at a similar report looking just in inventories and supply and i said to myself i can make the argument that you could you just buy as many as much real estate at rental real estate residential real estate as possible yeah, over the next insane. couple of years and because just the supply and demand it's 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 simple and it's easy to oversimplify um but i'm like i'm like i can easily make the case that you just go out and buy every apartment building that you can get your hands on yeah and that underlies that uh, attitude underlies a lot of um a lot of my thoughts when I was preparing this, looking at, and we're going to talk about multifamily, um, but it is it is so unprecedented that it's hard to find an argument against it, and that that's what makes me a little bit it's like it's historic on for for investors. Yeah. It's great, but that that uncertainty and the unprecedented aspect of it, it's 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 a little bit scary because mm-hmm. and and I've been saying this a long time. Like I think that there is a big crisis that's looming. And it, it, at this point, I am very 
surprised that that we haven't seen uh, New York Times headlines twice a week about it. Um, I it just seems like the next big thing that that uh, that's a, that's going to hit. Um, and you see a little bit of mention in the in the Build Back Better Act, but not as much as as you'd think. They're talking about family leave when really I think the issue is where are people going to live. It's live, not leave. <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, there, there, there is, I mean, a decent amount of money earmarked in the build back better for affordable housing, but that's not, that's not going to solve the problem. You know, we really just need more development in general of all, of all types of housing. And that's certainly going to help on one um, section, but it's, it's not the kind of the the only, only solution. All right. So Matt, let's, uh, let's, let's pop into this globe street article. Um, I've been told that multifamily absorption crushes the record demand seen last quarter matt is that even possible what's what's going on yeah you know you could crush it uh you can shatter it whatever whatever <laughs> broken record Smash. again yeah it's it's uh they're running out of are living in more and more apartments than than they were ever before um they've flown past their high points multiple times in 2021 like i said we're seeing all this demand on the renter side and the question is what are what are investors doing because investors are just as interested and i think that the nature of demand both from investors and from renters is now they're going to go start going into smaller markets and maybe even smaller sub markets so that's what you should really look at is maybe it's you know maybe everyone's clamoring for the sunbelt cities and stuff uh but but the but the market is and it's uniform really mostly uniform except outside maybe like san francisco mm-hmm. the demand from renters is so high that you go into anywhere and you'll and you'll have great rent growth um you just need to make a, a well-reasoned decision but it's not like opportunities are gone um so so this is a really nice opportunity for investors um but again like i said uh, it's strange the abnormal um and the record-breaking aspects of it leaves a little bit of uncertainty so that's uh that's the the it, it's hard for me to wrap my head around this yeah. much of this much of absor- absorption i mean it's almost double what we may expect in a year and, and matt i i just i want to i just have the best way I just is to read this first couple of paragraphs of this globe street article of his this marks the first time the trailing four quarter sum has exceeded 500,000 units of absorption. Again, you know, we usually see absorption kind of in the round 300,000 units plus or minus net absorptions of investment grade market rate apartments track, but uh, by climb to, um, 268,331 in the third quarter alone up from an already strong 218,763 units in the second quarter of 21. So we're basically getting, and, and we've seen this with rent growth, where this is not unique to even just multifamily apartments. We're essentially seeing a year's worth of growth in a quarter. So we're yeah. going to, we're going to see four years of economic growth, What we would typically see we're getting that in one year. Um, so every pro forma that, you know, has, you know, you, you're looking at an apartment, pro, any kind of pro forma of anything projections, take time to account, you know, making assumptions of growth, like after that fourth year, that's oftentimes when you should have you that project seasoned. Like when we look at a project by year two or year three, like we really should be seasoned and really kind of hitting our stride. Um, that that's all happened um, within you know a year's period, even more even more than that. Now there's obviously operations. And this is just you know growth. Yeah. And, so and and but, uh, absorptions and and this is <laughs> this is my layman's uh, absorption represents every. Every unit of absorption represents an empty apartment that's now filled by a renter. Is that that? Yeah, okay. somebody signed a lease. Okay. Or, so on, yeah. the, on the micro level, when you're seeing absorption, you can expect your empty apartments to fill up because that's what's happening throughout the country. Is that is that an oversimplification or? Yeah. No. No. <laughs> okay, I mean, okay. it, it's yeah. I mean, it's obviously it's market by market. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, um, we're seeing more demand, and that's why occupancy is so high. Okay. Um, so wow. just just uh, so the, the trailing four quarter sum increased twenty two point six percent in Q three to reach six hundred ten thousand seven hundred fifteen units, up two hundred and eight percent from the prior year. Um, U.S. demand for apartments overall continued to soar in Q three. Pre- preliminary calculations from RealPage show the nation's occupied apartment count jumped by two hundred and fifty five thousand 
units during the July to September time frame. That's the biggest quarterly product absorption figures figures seen in records that go back to the early 1990s. So it's it just it, it breaks it breaks, but they they can't even go back far enough to find similar. Um, examples. The annual demand volume as of third quarter registered at 500, 597,354 units in the preliminary stats. The figures soared beyond the past economic cycle's peak of some 380,000 units absorbed in the year ending third quarter of 2018. Annual product demand averaged about 250,000 units in 2010 to 2020. So, yeah, so exactly basically we're doing a year's worth on average of growth or absorption in a single quarter it, yep. it, it's amazing um but i do want to dovetail that piece matt with this other globe street article yeah of uh, which i think is i think we need to kind of come back to reality um a little bit is basically saying um that slower apartment rent growth in november resembles historic norms and it's this is a very good thing we need to have some normalcy yeah. um and things are everything is still way up there was still rent growth but you know, there's there's a seasonality to most industries and certainly, um, you know, the housing industry and things slow down after school starts and fall comes and holidays, you know, less people are moving around. It gets cold. I'm sure some people are moving around, but this just isn't the peak time of the year. You know, and yeah. that makes sense. It's and that's and that's something that I think we've noted ourselves um, actually in in looking at previous articles on this phenomenon. And record-breaking and unprecedented rent growth also mean that it's difficult to predict things um, and that that there is uncertainty in the market that makes it difficult to evaluate a potential investment. Even though it's going up and up and up, there's still that that kernel of, yeah. of uncertainty is, you know, you don't know when it's going to stop. And the signs yeah. of normalcy here might just suggest that it's going to be easier to make these assessments. There's finally something that resembles something that has happened before. There's a pattern. There's a way to predict. And without yeah. that way to predict, then it, then it doesn't seem like much of an investment, more like a gamble. Well, it's so easy to miss. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's there's so much more speculation because in the past, what we would do is, is we would say, okay, you know, here we're looking at an apartment building and here's where the rents are. Here's where we think we can take them. So we're going to, you know, bake that rent growth in through our you know, doing renovating the units, getting the rents up to that level. But then we have, you know, an organic rent growth um, variable and typically it was 3% unless we thought that the rent was going to be significantly higher. Maybe we would use, you know, four or 5%. That was kind of like a 5% would be a very hot, like high organic gro growth that we would maybe use one year to kind of simulate that we think that just work the rents of this property are going to get up to market um, outside of a, a renovation. Um, and then it'd be 3% flat, just barely beating uh, inflation that we were assuming is going to be around 2%, even though it was even under 2% many years. And often years we would beat that. But now you can't just say, I'm going to put, I'm going to force my appreciation to get this amount of growth and then 3% thereafter. Because that, yeah. that's been standard underwriting. Okay, 3%. Growth, two percent expenses growth. And but now, I, if yeah. you have to say, okay, is it going to be five percent, six percent, six percent grant growth? Oh no, but maybe it has to be twelve percent this year. Now, is it going to be ten percent the next year? Are we going to go down to six to five to four three? And it's so easy to miss because if you have in ten percent rent growth for four years, and all of a sudden it's five percent after in the latter several years that you were thinking you're going to get double that you could totally screw up your projections mm -hmm. much more than if you were thinking it was, you know, you thought it was going to be five, but it ends up being four. Um, and, yeah. but the, uh, conversely, if you are not taking a somewhat education, should educated guess and speculating on growth because it's reality, we're not speculating that there's like, a, there is growth, there is rent growth. It's not going to stop tomorrow. It just, is it next year or two years from now? Yeah. Um, if you're not factoring in some level of accelerated growth, you're just not winning any projects because yep. you're not a market. Well, and that is, and that's my, uh, that's what I've been thinking about this whole thing is it's not necessarily even, uh, yes, you will bring your own assumptions to the bargaining table and that will help to kind of structure what you're going to bid on, but you've got to, but I guarantee you when you go in to to look for an apartment to buy, there's going to be an investor that has a much more optimistic take. And uh, the, and like, so who's going to be right. And there, it seems like there's always going to be someone that thinks that, that we're going to continue the mm -hmm. 15, 
twenty percent rent growth in year in in a year, and and signs of normalcy hopefully will reduce that you know this this fervor that we're seeing and allow for a little bit more of a reasonable. Well, it, it's it's the it's speculation, but also just the acceptance of lower returns from some investors. Yeah. Because let's mm-hmm. let's say you've tripled your money in an apartment deal over the last three years, but you're trying to maintain a similar level of cash flow. Well, you can get returns that are a third of what you were originally receiving on that initial investment. So if you needed an eight, if, so if you were getting an eight percent, but you've tripled your money, um, you know, you could be getting half the returns. You'd be getting, you could be getting four percent, but your net is twelve percent based on that initial investment. So the volume of cash is still more. So you see so many investors that have been, um, you know, been cycling out of projects. And they don't necessarily they, they they want to replace the cash flow, but they don't they need less they require less of a return yeah. to do so. That's a really and there's, good point. And there's so many of those investors out there, especially in the more you know larger institutional um, class A market, and not even class A, just just more of the larger institutional deals, um, whether it be 1031 money um, or you know just just deep pocket investors. And so that makes it very difficult um, for groups like us that are they're trying to, you know, hit you know above average um, risk adjusted returns. It's very you know it's instead of looking at getting one deal out of every hundred we look at now it's every two or three hundred. Yeah. So. Um, where do you want to go next, Matt? Um, we've got this uh, apartment list migration report. We could go through. Yeah, we could talk like, about Gen Zers. What you know? What uh? What, I what's, think the, what are you the, feeling? The migration report notes notes it's something that I was that I was kind of um, I was kind of talking about. Does a shit. note or connote? Connote. I, it, it touches on a subject that I was hinting at earlier when I said you know this demand that we're seeing is is across the country. And maybe, you know, and maybe if you're trying to compete for for popular places in in a popular sub market, let's say, uh, maybe there's another maybe there's a whole nother market out there that uh, that has a bunch of opportunities. And and this is happening for renters as well as for, uh, you know, apartment buyers. Um, People are looking outside of the traditional places to live. Um, I think, yeah, yeah, this is one of the most interesting things uh, for 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 Indianapolis, if you want to look. Uh, no, sure, let me zoom in. The uh, yeah, if you, if you want to, um, that's the inbound searches. Now, where do you think the outbound searches are? And I'll give you a hint: it's not Chicago. Oh, well, I looked at it before this, so yeah. I know. But uh, <laughs> all right, yeah. <laughs> but let's 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 look. Yeah, it surprised me that it was Louisville. Yeah. So, um, so and and Indiana. They're moving south. Yeah. Well, and here and this is just a perfect example of what uh, of kind of what I was talking about, and and. And it remains to be seen how strong these migration trends are. But the fact that there is a trend, people are not. Indianapolis is commonly, you know, associated with Chicago. Um, you know, you grow up there, you you graduate from high school. Ah, oh, I'm getting out of this city. I'm going to a big city. I'm going to Chicago. Yeah, what's the closest one? Uh, <laughs> exactly. And um, and and to see that the majority of these renters are looking for Louisville really seems like that sign of well, rents are high. I want a place that's uh, this just a change changing preferences um and so it's it's kind of encouraging for for investors uh that want multifamily opportunities that are outside these larger cities um it, and to look at these smaller places like louisville or kansas city or, or anything like that so yeah i just thought that was an interesting uh really indianapolis was an example of of some of the larger trends that i think we're yeah. seeing the investor and the renter side and i, I think it's, it's it's good to mention um uh, kind of where the, the kind of the top list of inbound and outbound searches. So for inbound searches, San Jose um, really kind of reaping the benefits um, from people moving out of the Bay Area. Um, Raleigh, North Carolina, not a huge surprise there. You know, been increasingly popular place to live. Been, been in New Orleans, uh, Richmond, Virginia, number four, Nashville, number five. There you go, Louisville right there. A lot of people look, look at moving to Louisville, um, which you, we've seen that in the... Um, Supply coming online, and they had a little bit of occupancy drop in Louisville this last year. I haven't looked in the past couple of months, but they had so a little bit of softness, but I, but there's a ton of growth also, and you can see that showing up in the numbers. Yeah, Providence, Rhode Island. It is interesting. What are they? They noted that that Raleigh, San Jose, and Austin as these uh, almost like the, these revolving door metros, mm-hmm. uh, places where you know you will see a lot of inbound and outbound. Um, yeah. Yeah. I I don't know how 
what the state is or how that will evolve, um, you know, as the pandemic winds down. But it does seem like, you know, maybe I, I don't. And, and that was a big question, too, is when you move somewhere, how long do you live there? Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that's just an open. And that's got to be that's got to be a decreasing amount. And I'm, I'm yeah. sure it changes, you know per age think, demographic in, yeah. in an industry. If you're in the tech industry, maybe you are moving around, you know, to Louisville and to Boston, to, to LA or say, you know, wherever, and you can work remotely. So it doesn't matter. You've got that flexibility. Um, I'm, I, there's a lot of factors. And I imagine some of those metros just attract that type of um, resident. So it's yeah. interesting. Um, New York, who's moving from New York? Looks like Florida. Everyone's moving to Florida. Yeah. That's not surprising. Um, eight states get more search internet search interest from California than, than from any other state. Um, man, Nevada, way up there. Yeah, I thought this was a really uh, a really telling map too. Um, you look at these are this is the percentage of people from each state that are from California. So <laughs> if you add these up, it's over a hundred. That's because fifty one percent of people coming into Nevada are from California. 36% of mm -hmm. people that come mm -hmm. in from Alaska are from California. And, and, and I've said this before, but there's uh, so it was a friend of mine that lives in, in Phoenix. And he says, you know, he's walking around and, and Hey, where are you from? California, San Francisco, mm -hmm. Los Angeles, Los Angeles, you know, San Diego, yeah. they're all from California. And, um, and so this influx, I think I, I do wonder if, if things are going to shake up a little bit and, and maybe return to normal as this winds down, because there was such a difference in, lifestyle there's so many lifestyle changes and and maybe once once there's got to be some people who are like oh you know this isn't i didn't like i don't like this as much yeah. as i thought i would now mm -hmm. some people are gonna be like i'm not i'm never moving back some people i know have moved out of california they they do love it um but i also know someone who's sort of moved back so i, I think it's yeah. it'll be interesting how things shake up over the next couple of years um also interesting to see alaska i guess it makes sense uh, people moving to a lot of to Hawaii, at least be from California, Alaska is kind of interesting. Sort of makes sense. Yeah. Sort of closer than you, closer than you think. Southern edge of Alaska. It's warming up. <laughs> it is. Um, okay. So, so just last report I want to touch on um, again, there's so much great information to touch on every report. Um, and again, greatreport.com. You can kind of find a lot of this. And if you're not signed up for the great report newsletter, Make sure you are. You can do that at greatreport.com or greatcapitalllc.com. If you've been appreciating this video, definitely give us give it a like and uh, give us a subscribe. If you haven't done that, and comment below. Just let us know you're uh, listening and you enjoyed it. And, you know, let us know if you disagree. But, Matt, so uh, National Apartment Association, they did a survey. Um, Gen Zers, the complexities of the digital generation. Um, some insights. Yeah, these are where the cool kids are all moving, or or what the what the cool we're not we're old millennials now, um, but I think that there are some insights that that carry over from from Gen the younger Gen Zs into um, th that I could definitely see uh, jibe with millennial preferences as well. I I think that um, one one of the interesting things was again talking about location, they want to live in vibrant suburbs. Um, this was not what I was hearing you know, 10, 15 years ago, everyone wanted to go downtown. Um, mm -hmm. Millennials were, you know, there was this return to, to downtown. And I wonder if these preferences were affected at all by the, the pandemic um, or not. But on the whole, th there's so much more of a proportion of Gen Z renters that prefer vibrant suburbs, according to a city. Now, a vibrant suburb, <laughs> I don't know what the difference between that is. Uh, quiet? Yeah, yeah. We want that, that's like suburbs. downtown Carmel or Fishers versus, yeah, yeah. And you know, way out there in Westfield or Whitestown. And, and that's what we're seeing now, we're, too, at least in Indianapolis, and I'm sure it's true in other cities, is these suburbs that are becoming, that have like a dense core um, where there are, there are retail and, and dining and entertainment centers. Um, and you also can get a little bit more space as well. Yeah. Um, so that's, that is a really interesting development that, uh, that contrasts with this return to downtown that, um, that I witnessed, you know, when I was, when yeah. I was the cool kid. Well, I, I'd be curious yeah. if they had the survey, we could go back 10, 15 years ago, um, yeah. because it, it's really, it's 50, 50, it's basically 50, 50 between, um, well, sorry, no, it, it's like, it's what, 50, 54, 40, 55, 56. 
56, 44, whatever, between mm-hmm. rural, call it call it city and not city, yeah. between quiet suburbs, vibrant suburbs, and rural. Now, I think I think you could probably break out vibrant suburbs because I think some of those vibrant suburbs are really kind of urban centers. Yeah, They're I just agree. Yeah. not downtown, which so it, it, the lines are being blurred of what preferences are. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Matt, when we were growing up, you know, people were living in the suburbs, but there were no real vibrant suburb yep. options. Oh, uh, well, that's that's what I think is really interesting. Yeah. But, but now we've had a whole co- generation or three that have been raised in the suburbs, each generation being a little bit larger than the last, who are now familiar with the suburbs, have grown up. It's normal to them. It's not this like, yeah, some of the people out in the suburbs, but it's kind of like there's not so much stuff to do out there. Now there's tons of stuff to do in the suburbs. Um, they've or- grown up during it. And then downtown, I mean, I was talking about, you talk to people and they're like, and they're, they're like, you know, downtowns are dangerous. Um, so, you know, I'm going to stay. Well, place. and, and that another thing could happen is maybe millennials, they lived downtown for, for five, 10 years. They want to start a family and they want to replicate that lifestyle that they had downtown. And 100%. So, you see, so you see more investment in things like, you know, restaurants and, and, and entertainment, you know, there's like concert, not concert halls, but you know, but there's there, live entertainment there, there and yeah. Yeah, there are. Thing, yeah. Okay. Location factors. Uh, what factors will influence your decision for the next location of your apartment? Uh, proximity to work and school. Um, location, location, location. Um, you know, that makes sense. You know, what are you going to be doing the most? Um, yeah. And then entertainment, dining, shopping, public transit. Not, I mean, the big thing is public transit isn't that important. Mm-hmm. Um, you hear so much. And this may be different. So you hear on, um, especially like the Eastern Seaboard, you know, transit oriented housing where they're really building up around these major transit hubs. That That's like a Eastern Seaboard thing, you know, yeah. New York, you know, that it, it, it's not like a Midwest or even Southeast thing. Um, family, family, f- family, friendly neighborhoods, people like that. Proximity, family and friends. It's important too. renting, renting sentiment. I think this is interesting. I think everyone's a little, j- a little mm-hmm. jaded here. Um, you know, so. Um, so renting means I have to live by the owner's rules that is, it, I don't know if that's sentiment that, yes, that, that's that is gen, true. That's like a Gen Z, you know, that's what they, younger kids want to think about. Well, at, least, at least, so, at least like a very small percentage disagrees that they don't think they live by someone's rules. So everyone's yeah. on the same page there. Um, so I feel like it's neutral. Renting gives me more flexibility than owning. Looks like most people, um, agree with that or are neutral to it. Some people strongly disagree. I think renting is definitely more flexible. Um, I feel like I'm throwing my money away by renting. Some um, the majority of people uh, agree agree with that. They they think that they're throwing their money away by renting. Um, and I would say that I mean, you're not throwing your money away. You're getting a place to live. Yeah. I think I think people get frustrated is that they're paying off somebody else's mortgage versus I could be paying off a loan. I could be you know paying off my house. I yeah. would say the alternative that renting also works in as opposed to buying a house as an investment, you can rent and invest that money in yep. stock market, real estate, but investment real estate, where the goal is to make a return on your investment, not just a place to live, because those things don't, they can overlap, but not always. Um, home ownership sentiment. Um, again, this is who doesn't want to own a home, um, but a home is more important, is more private than one that you rent pretty much everyone's in agreement there that's Own- really interesting though in and that jibes with a want a desire to come to the suburbs and this desire for more space i want this privacy aspect is yeah. it, it could it could really you know it's something for multifamily uh for multifamily designer architects really to kind of consider is how can we foster this sense of privacy well, so do you uh, think this yeah. is more of like the physical makeup of like the they're on a balcony or so whatever or do you that's think what it, I, I i took it more of knock 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 you know maintenance mm-hmm. walk i'm oh, gonna walk into yeah. your apartment at any point yeah. that that that's that's to me what i took it is people don't like um you know their landlord or maintenance barging in yeah um and but like there any- are other aspects of of privacy i wonder you know if we could if it and it may attract that's all i'm saying is it could attract gen z renters if a property manager was able to come up with the flyer that, that really, you know, a, a perspective on the apartments that really emphasizes the privacy and how secluded it is and, and how, but that's, you know, that's, but it's, but it's like, you're still, you know, unless like your windows are just open, you know, you've got, yeah, yeah. you've got blinds in your windows. 
it's private and you know so you know you're still all connect units in one building yeah i do think though the build to rent that's where build to rent get comes into play because mm -hmm. you know having your uh, actually own space um okay owning a home means more control over your life um most people agree with that um i i i, I guess I, I i don't really know though um yeah. i mean you're you don't want that you know Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robbie Kosaki, you know, that home can be a major liability. And mm -hmm. I know a lot of people who their home can kind of control their life. You got all your weekends are booked. You're doing home maintenance. So yeah. maybe that's what you want to do. But um, versus the flexibility of someone doing all that for you by renting. I can't imagine ever be financially secure enough to own a home. Um, you know, this is they're at least optimistic enough to, to mostly say that, well, you know, at least over six, what does it look this look 55%. Is that right? That doesn't seem like, is this even, anyway, um, the majority, they disagree. They're thinking that at some point they're going to be able to own a home. Yeah. Um, but a big chunk, um, basically 30%, yes, yes. So 30, 70% think, yeah, I'm going to own a home. 30% never going to own a home. Um, you can want to own a home. Doesn't mean that you actually are going to be able to own a home anytime soon. Um, okay. Amenities. I thought this was all interesting. Look at these amenities. Um, especially for the cost of some of these amenities sorry i'm just zooming in so guaranteed parking is big it, it's i want a place to park mm -hmm. and not just parking but i want my own spot guaranteed parking and that's something that's probably that's relatively easy to do whether it's you know assigned parking can be difficult but it's it's preferred way over swimming pool or top quality workout facilities and again in general the amount of most of the amount of money in an amenity space is the are the less appreciated mm -hmm. amenities so so going backwards and reverse so top quality workout facilities are the least um top top interested uh, amenity then swing pool is a little bit more but there's a big difference people want guaranteed parking they want wi-fi a wi-fi enabled community you know internet they want fast internet i think they could be rephrased the same way they, they want a fast internet the guaranteed parking security and access control features yeah it's 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 practical it's 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 much more practical than i really care about my swim swimming pool or my fitness facility yeah it re-emphasizes because a lot of this stuff is is fairly standard too um yeah some of it yeah some of it some of it is some of it isn't um in unit apartment amenities um not i'm, I'm surprised cell phone reception is so low yeah. washer and dryer inside the apartment internet mm -hmm. speed inside the apartment interior features um, now, spacious this, floor plan all those are kind of about the same what i thought was interesting was that they note that um that a dedicated office is not critical um for them now this is a different which is much different than we thought you know for probably for millennials and older are looking for those for a little bit more for more space for that dedicated office now these Gen Z wants a spacious floor plan, but they don't necessarily want to use it for working at home. And and it's it, I think it's an interesting aspect that again it may refer more. Or maybe to they age, may, maybe they are. They're just not. They don't need a dedicated workspace. Yeah. Because yeah. they will maybe like you know, they want a multi-use space or or whatever. Yeah. Okay. That was that was a good report. All right, Matt. I really appreciate um, taking the time to put all this good stuff together. Um, this is a great rendition of the great report. Hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving. Um, a lot of lot to be grateful for, thankful for, and uh, we are grateful and thankful for your interest in uh, the Great Report. Um, we enjoy doing it, um, and we hope you are getting something out of it as well. Trying to stay up to date. And again, if you're not signed up for the Great Report newsletter, graycapitalllc.com slash newsletter is the direct way to sign up for that. Um, but also, make sure you've got a uh, bookmark, uh, graireport.com. It's the premier multifamily intelligence aggregator brought to you by Gray Capital. You're going to be able to save the date every single day. Matt, any um, any closing thoughts? You know, I, I hope your son's feeling better. Thanks, um, he doesn't have COVID. Um, we we talked about turkey techniques yeah. last week. Any any I got a uh, question any for additional you. thoughts? Because I know I caught you off guard with so, that one last. You know, week. I learned that maybe turkey smoking and we. I'd love to see an experiment still. Maybe you par smoke it and you, ha you smoke it halfway and then you could fry it, fry it for the, for the, just to top it off. 
Yep. My question is, what is your side dish? Because there are maps out there. Every state has their own. Yep. Yep. I, I saw yours? that. What do you like the most? Um. So what I like the most is a good, um, like stra- stuffing or dressing. Yep. I kind of go for the more like southern style like dressing instead of like the stovetop like box. Like I try to I like to make my own. Mm-hmm. Get some like brioche. Leave it out for a day. Get it crusty. Yep cook it down some really nice, nice broth, herbs and onions. Um, I'm going to try though a French. I saw, th- I saw this, um, I'll try a French onion, um, dressing or stuffing. It's like a French onion soup style, mm-hmm. like, um, That's like good. dressing or stuffing. It sounded interesting. Um, also we saw, I think both these were like in the New York times magazine or something. Um, we saw, we were flying back from Arizona last week, but, um, this like, it was like cream spinach pot pie. Hmm. So just think of like cream spinach inside like a like a flaky phyllo dough like pie situation. So th- those are like the two new yeah, things I'm going to yeah. try out. But obviously, you got I, I'm relatively simple mashed potatoes, gravy. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe maybe there's some green beans. Got my turkey, um, a dressing or two. Um, one staple of my family is um, an oyster stuffing mm, or oyster good. dressing. Yeah, yeah, oyster stuffing. That's, I think it's unique. Some people don't like it. I, I think it's good. Um, and then Alex said a family makes a really good horseradish stuffing also. So I like to kind of a couple different stuffings and dressings, get them potatoes, I gravy, maybe vegetable, turkey, roll, and then uh, pass out. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm all for stuffing. Um, mm-hmm. I, uh, you're going to have to bring some leftovers <laughs> mm-hmm. on Monday. I'll sample all of small containers of each style of stuffing that you have. Well, I'll, I'll do, I'll do my, I'll do my best. We always, we yeah, are always true. thinking we're going to have leftovers, but then like we have a decent enough, like get, size of gathering that all of a sudden it gets divvied up and yeah. like, wait, we're actually doing like a neck and more Turkey than we need to. Like we're doing like a whole other Turkey just to make sure that there are like enough leftovers for everybody. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. My, uh, my mother-in-law makes the best stuffing. Nice. Um, I don't think that my mother is going to watch this, but uh, I will say. I have a favorite. <laughs> cut, it, cut the clip out. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we've got two Thanksgiving parts. Now we can kind of compile and put together. So all the tips and tricks. Um, that's why people are here, obviously, is to get <laughs> Thanksgiving. That's right. I'm making advice. All right. Thank you for watching the great report. Hope we make some great investing decisions out there. We'll catch you next week. Thanks.